Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. And our first question is from Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to Sustrans report transport poverty in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Transport poverty is not acceptable in Scotland, which is why we invest over £1 billion annually in public and sustainable transport. We will take account of Sustrans research in our current review of the National Transport Strategy. And in the programme for government, we've already announced our intention to double our annual spend on active travel to £80 million per annum. The report states that one million people live in data zones where there is a high risk of transport poverty and access to public transport is not good enough. Yet under this SNP government, bus passenger numbers have plummeted whilst fares have gone up. They're now formally consulting on restrictions to a bus pass that is currently available to all over the age of 60, including those on low incomes and in in-work poverty. And this is the government that failed to back Labour's plan to freeze all rail fares this year and wants to cut air passenger duty for the wealthy frequent flying few. Will they concede that their own decisions can contribute to and have contributed to transport poverty in this country? And what steps will they now take to poverty-proof transport policy and ensure that public transport is accessible and affordable to all. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I don't accept the premise of Neil Bibby's uh, question. And also, I would say that in relation to his comments on rail, of course, it was this government that asked under the Smith Commission for the ability to have a public transport bid uh, for our rail franchises, something which the Labour Party failed to do. The Labour Party said they wanted to do that, but failed to even ask Smith. Uh, and this government is the one that's contributed hugely to the uh, expansion of rail services to areas not previously served, uh, either by stations or even in the case of Borders Rail Line, uh, to new lines as well. The biggest new railway line in over 100 years in the whole of the UK. In relation to the report, of course it's important that we have the concessionary travel scheme, although I have heard over the years, I've been in this Parliament from the Labour benches, calls to limit that scheme. I've heard it from the Conservative benches as well. It's perfectly proper for us to go out and consult in relation to the concessionary travel scheme. And of course, the first place in Scotland that introduced a full concessionary travel scheme was my own local authority of Club Manager. So the SNP has got a proud record in terms of concessionary travel. We've extended the number of people in the categories that can access that, and it's quite right that we hold a consultation on its future development. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Can uh, the Cabinet Secretary advise of the progress of any consideration of the reopening of a rail link going from Dice to Ellen and possibly beyond to the towns of Banff and Buchan, given those of mine and Stuart Stevenson's constituency, the public transport options that so many other areas of Scotland presently enjoy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we remain fully committed to funding high-quality, reliable rail services, as I've mentioned, and securing the necessary funding for sustainable investment in the railway to support communities and to meet future projections for demand. And we've seen hugely increased demand for rail travel. Uh, the offer that we've received from the UK government leaves a shortfall of £600 million on what the industry is telling us it needs. But I can assure you that our immediate priority is to press the Treasury to secure a fair deal for Scotland. And indeed, uh, my officials are meeting Treasury counterparts today. In the meantime, we'll continue to work with the rail industry to plan for the next rail investment period from 2019, including options for investment such as the one which Gillian Martin mentions. Transport Scotland are also currently reviewing work that Nestrans have undertaken to consider options for transport improvements north of Aberdeen as part of their Fraserburgh and Peterhead to Aberdeen transport study. And I also understand that Nestrans have invited local MSPs, MPs and councillors to a briefing on the 3rd of November to outline their emerging findings. Early work also commenced on a strategic transport appraisal as part of the Aberdeen City Region deal which I was involved in. And this will take a 20-year strategic view of the North East region's transport connections across all modes, including road and rail. And I look forward to seeing the outcomes of that study in due course. And Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Sustrans report research applied their calculations to the whole of Scotland and found that 20% of neighbourhoods studied were at high risk of transport poverty. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what the Scottish Government's response is to the findings that high-risk areas are largely outside urban areas, demonstrating the SNP's lack of care and focus to rural communities? Cabinet Secretary. I would to hear that from a Conservative uh, in mm. terms of lack of support for bus services. When we've seen, of course, the Conservatives uh, are the ones that have uh, been responsible for the budget cuts. Uh, but despite that, we have funded 
uh, hugely, both in terms of bus service operators grant and, of course, in terms of concessionary travel. And I've heard a number of calls from Conservatives over the years asking for us to cut back on the concessionary travel scheme. Uh, in terms of the report, Transport Scotland have welcomed the report. There are some uh, limitations to it, which Sustrans themselves point out in terms of analysis. But we welcome the report and we will take the report into account as we seek to take forward the national transport strategy and, of course, the future uh, funding and support for bus services, which is at record levels under this government. Question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it takes to encourage people from deprived communities to get involved in sport and physical activity. Minister Eileen Campbell. The Scottish Government is committed to increasing rates of physical activity. The Active Scotland Outcomes Framework sets out our ambitions for a more active Scotland and is underpinned by a commitment to equality. We are committed to ensuring that community sports hubs provide opportunities for all to participate in sport and benefits to the communities they serve. Current work is focusing on hubs located in communities in the lowest 5% of the SMIND areas. In addition, our Active Schools programme offers opportunities for children and young people who may experience barriers to participation. Mark Griffin. I thank the Minister for that answer. The recently published Barclay report recommends that certain public buildings, such as leisure centres and uh, potentially some of the hubs that the Minister talks about which are operated at arm's length by local authorities should pay business rates. In the North Lanarkshire Council area, the estimated cost of that would be four and a half to five million pounds a year and have a massive impact on their ability to encourage people living in deprived communities to get involved in sport and physical activity. Can the Minister say if she agrees with me on the impact of this proposal and if she's lobbied the Finance Secretary to reject that particular recommendation? Minister. The, the, you know, the, the, uh, Derek Mackay made a statement to the Parliament out set, uh, setting out his uh, approach and recommendations from the uh, Barclay Review and also the consideration he wants to give further to the impact on Alios. And I understand he'll be making uh, a statement to update Parliament uh, 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 this uh, year. Marie Todd. Thank you, Thank you, Presiding Officer Tusk. Um, I'd like to ask the Minister if the Women and Girls in Sport Advisory Board will examine the challenges of female participation in deprived areas. Minister. The Women and Girls in Sport Advisory Board will look at how to increase participation and raise awareness in sport and physical activity for girls and women and will explore all the barriers that women and girls face in terms of accessibility and that of course will also include deprivation but we should take heart in what is currently happening right across the country to provide girls with opportunities illustrated through our recent Women and Girls in Sport Week and the sports that are uh, reporting an increase in girls' participation, including karate, rugby, dodgeball and cross-country. Good work is happening. More must be done, though, and I'll continue to keep the member who has a clear interest in this uh, updated with that work as it progresses. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And given that we know if we, if we get young people active, uh, they are more likely to remain active into adulthood, and that the Active Schools programme highlights a 11% greater uptake from deprived, deprived areas, would it not suggest that increasing extracurricular activity in schools should be a main drive of this government in making sure that access to sport for all? Minister. Those projects has been a real success and has indicated that higher participation rates have happened in areas of deprivation, showing that when there's opportunity, eh, a broad range of opportunities for young people, they will take them up. And that's why we'll continue to work with Sports Scotland to support that good work and ensuring that young people uh, eh, and eh, other older people as well get the opportunities they, they need to ensure that they can become more active because we know of the health benefits that that brings. Richard Lockwood. Uh, the Minister will be aware that to address this issue we need sports facilities within our communities. We should therefore welcome the exciting proposal for a Murray Sports Centre and urge her officials and indeed Sports Scotland to offer uh, appropriate financial support and any other advice that is possible. Minister. Um, I'm very well of the proposals that the member outlines and his uh, enthusiasm as well for promoting them. Uh, the proposed development, I understand that discussions are ongoing between the developers and Sports Scotland relating to the plans and proposals. And I would strongly encourage all parties to continue this dialogue and certainly do what we can to support with advice uh, and support in this uh, as it progresses. And I look forward to being kept updated as this project updates and, of course, uh, continue to engage with the member on that uh, work as well. Question number three, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Transport Scotland and what issues were discussed. Cameron Secretary Keith Brown. 
Uh, as Transport Scotland is part of the Scottish Government, meetings with ministers occur regularly in the normal course of business. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Um, during the recent debate on the Leave Mouth Rail Link, the Transport Minister said that he's minded to instruct officials from Transport Scotland to take on responsibility for the GRIP 4 process. However, since then, in written response to questions, the Minister has said it's not possible to define timescales for any GRIP 4 work until completion of the STAG and the GRIP 3 stage. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm to the Chamber what stage of the process we are at and what work, if any, so far the Transport Scotland is currently carrying out in relation to the Leaving Mouth Rail project? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think it was the case that my colleague Hamza Yosef said, uh, I think as Claire Baker has mentioned after the members' debate last month, that he was going to task Transport Scotland to take forward the feasibility around the Leavenworth, uh, literally Leavenmouth rail campaign, but was to do that with the agreement of Fife Council. I understand that those discussions are ongoing. So the intention is there. I think it's um, something which Claire Baker has spoken on a number of times in this chamber, as have a number of other members uh, from uh, Fife as well. So that intention uh, is there to do that, and it's in the process of being uh, discussed both between Transport Scotland uh, and uh, Fife Council. And if uh, the member is keen, I can make sure that uh, Hamza Yusuf passes on uh, a full account of how those discussions are going. Jamie Green. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Uh, we know that spending on ferries in Scotland has doubled in the last 10 years, with subsidies to operators also doubling over the same period. Audit Scotland has recently warned that there is no Scotland-wide long-term strategy, that the state of half of our harbours is unknown, and that Transport Scotland will find it increasingly difficult to provide services within its budget. If all that is the case, why is this government so intent on awarding direct in-house contracts, which will surely only add to the cost of the network? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the, the position of awarding future contracts is under review for reasons which Jamie Green, I'm sure, is well aware of. But I'm not sure if Jamie Green's attacking the Scottish Government for the introduction of RET, which has seen a major boost to our islands, or for keeping uh, prices affordable for our island communities. This Government has a very proud record of supporting our uh, communities which are dependent upon ferries. That includes building new ferries like the fantastic Loch Seaforth. Uh, so we have, and also many areas of Scotland, have benefited from investment in our harbours and ports. So I think there's been a huge investment by this government in our ferries, and we're very proud of that. If the uh, Conservatives and Jamie Green want to propose cuts to those services, they'll get the chance to do that at the budget. But for this government, we'll continue to support our remote and islands communities by investing in our ferries and our ports. And Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary clarify concerns I've read recently about UK government cuts to the Scottish budget for railway investment? and how this may jeopardise vital improvements across the country. And as rail improvements to East Kilbride are long overdue, can the Minister confirm that the upgrade of the East Kilbride Glasgow rail line will remain a priority? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government uh, is very concerned uh, about the recent decision by the UK Government. Of course, the projection that's been made uh, leaves a shortfall of around £600 million. That's not the Scottish Government's estimate, that's the estimate uh, of the industry and what the industry tells us it needs. But I can assure uh, the member that our immediate priority is to press the Treasury to secure a fair deal for Scotland. And as I mentioned earlier on, uh, officials are meeting with Treasury counterparts today. In the meantime, though, we will continue to work with the rail industry to plan for the next rail investment period from 2019. And that includes, as the member asks about, options for investment in the East Kilbride line. Further uh, detailed on our approach to investment across the network in Scotland will be contained in the investment strategy due for publication later this year. And that will provide more information to the member on the question that she asks. And Jackie Bailey. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that the Kilcreggan to Gorick ferry service run by Clydelink for SPT is off more than it's on, and this is having a hugely negative impact on people in my constituency. Will the Cabinet Secretary fulfil the promise made by the Scottish Government to take over the running of the Kilcreggan to Gorick ferry before the contract is renewed next year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, this is a ferry service which is not run by the Scottish Government. Uh, it's the responsibility of SPT, and it does require uh, work in the active support of SPT for any decision to be taken in terms of it coming into the Scottish Government uh, and Transport Scotland's remit. Uh, I'm happy to get uh, my colleague Hamza Yosef to respond to the member to uh, tell her exactly where we're at in terms of that, but it does require the active support of SPT to bring a service. We've made the offer around the country to other uh, parts of the country which do not have Scottish Government directly run services that we are willing to enter into negotiations to take those on. The same applies to the Kilcraigan ferry, but it will require the support of the SPT. 
And question number four, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the importance of sprinklers in preventing deaths from fire. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Um, following the tragic fire at Grenfell Tower, the Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety is considering all relevant measures to ensure the safety of residents in high-rise domestic buildings, including a review of evidence on automatic fire suppression systems, including sprinklers. As the Member is aware, since 2005, building regulations have required an automatic fire suppression system to be installed in a variety of new buildings, including high-rise domestic buildings, residential care buildings, sheltered housing complexes, schools and enclosed shopping centres. The provision of sprinklers within existing high-rise domestic buildings is not compulsory. Sprinklers are, sprinklers are only one of a range of risk reduction measures and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service raises awareness of fire risk in the home and encourages people to take steps to make their homes safe. David Stewart. President officer, the Minister will be well aware that in Scotland there has never been multiple fire deaths where a working sprinkler has been in operation. In Wales and in Fife and Angus councils, they already have a policy of sprinklers in new build social housing. Will the Minister work with me in my Members' Bill to ensure a wider coverage of sprinkler systems to prevent death, injury and damage caused by fire in the future? Minister. Um, President Officer, the Scottish Government recognises um, the importance of fire suppression systems and we have put in place a working group uh, to look at all aspects of this and a separate uh, working group to look at building standards. I know that the uh, member has taken a great interest in this and that you met with the Cabinet Secretary uh, on the 12th of September and we will continue to update Mr Stewart on the work that we are doing and I'm sure that he will continue to engage with us uh, in this vital work. Graeme Simpson. The Fire Brigades Union has been calling for sprinklers to be fitted in all tower blocks, not just those since 2005, uh, for the last eight years. When will this happen? Minister. President officer, as I said in my earlier answer, fire suppression systems are, are one of many uh, ways of ensuring safety. Um, the expert group that we have put together, which includes international experts, will look at all of uh, the aspects uh, of this. Uh, beyond that, uh, Mr Simpson will be aware uh, that the Ministerial Working Group has also uh, called for an inventory of all high-rise buildings in Scotland uh, to make sure that the decisions that we take are the right ones for these buildings. Question number five, Maurice Corrie. Thank you, President uh, To ask the Scottish Government whether it will confirm its position on income tax ahead of its budget. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. London today, so I'm answering the question on his behalf. We will shortly publish a discussion paper on income tax and I encourage everyone in the Chamber and throughout the country to participate. The draft budget will be put before Parliament on the 14th of December and we will announce our formal policy intention then. Maurice Corrie. I thank the Minister for his reply. Nevertheless, a recently released FOI request revealed that the First Minister was warned in March that plans to implement the citizens' basic income would cost at least £12.3 billion a year. Can the Minister tell us if it is fair for every Scottish taxpayer to face a rate of 50% in tax to pay for this government's basic income policy, as evidenced by this government's own briefings? Minister. Thank, thank, the, thank the member for his question. The Scottish Government is very clear about the principles which will guide our tax policy. We believe that tax should be progressive, that those on the lowest income should not shoulder the burden of UK Government budget cuts. The upcoming discussion paper will cover the importance of progressivity and will be published with our policy intentions on the 14th of December. James Kelly. Given the substantial challenges in the Scottish budget around addressing the issues of child poverty, properly funding local councils and ensuring fair pay for public sector workers. Does the Minister agree that substantial changes around taxation are required in order to fund these challenges? Minister. The, Sc the Scottish Government has been very clear that uh, in terms of the, um, the, the process we are going through, that uh, stakeholder engagement is very, very important. We have written to all party leaders to ask for their views on um, 
on, on, on income tax in order that we can then have, the, have an, an honest, informed discussion. Unfortunately, as yet, I do not think the Labour Party has responded to that request. Thank you. And before we come to First Minister's questions now, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Steve Cachiwanyo, High Commissioner of the Republic of Namibia.